Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And today I'm going to be continuing with my series on the murder of Cleopatra. And this is going to be part four, the Battle of Actium. Uh, I know some of you have been watching the Netflix uh, documentary uh, called Queen Cleopatra. And this part where uh, Cleopatra is, is with Mark Anthony and then they go to war at Actium against Octavian. Um, it's not as bad as some of the rest of the show, but it still leaves out two very important things, as, do, as is true, actually, for most of history uh, and most of the historians. It's, it's kind of a fascinating that it's not that they have so many different facts in this part of the story. It's how they've interpreted them, which I find fascinating. And I think they follow the lead of Plutarch. He's the main writer about the history of Cleopatra. The one, again, I called Dan Brown of his time um, because he, he likes to exaggerate. He likes, and he really does not like Antony or Cleopatra. So he wants to make sure they look really, really bad. And for some reason, historians sort of go along with it. And they have this idea that somehow Antony is just a lovesick puppy and will do whatever Cleopatra tells him, and she is his downfall. And I find it just, well, it's ridiculous when you come right down to it. They're, they're both leaders of their countries. They've both been around a long time, and at the time Actium occurs, we're talking, they were together for 10 years. Um, and he was back and forth between Rome and, and Alexandria. So Antony had, he was still running the country of uh, his the Roman Empire essentially at that point with uh, Octavian, and they were trying to share it. Octavian was mostly doing the West, and and um, and Antony was mostly doing the East, and then Antony would roll back to Egypt and visit with Cleopatra. They had three children during that period of time, and and Cleopatra was the pharaoh of Egypt, and she was she was managing her country, and so. So far, so good over the years. I mean, there are there are issues, but but all of them are hanging on. But at one point, hmm, essentially, someone wanted to be the big winner. All right, and so let's see where we left off from last time. What was going to happen at this point, and when did it come to be a come to to a head? Um, I want to point out here. Um, between Octavian and Antony. They were sharing power, but neither one of them wanted to be the lesser partner in that you know, little regime. So there is this viewpoint, which certainly Octavian had, that two Caesars is one Caesar too many. In other words, <laughs> he needed Antony gone so he could be the one and only Caesar. And if you leave the other one alive, you got to watch your back, always because you never know when they're coming after you. So let, let me read the very last paragraph of the chapter before Actium starts. Octavian wasn't spreading such propaganda for his personal amusement. He, he was spreading a lot of propaganda in Rome against Antony and Cleopatra. To start his campaign against Antony, he needed to turn enough Romans against his foe so that they become enraged and would supply him with what he needed, ships, men, and provisions as soon as possible. He needed to take out Mark Antony quickly. This is at this point in time. He declared war on Egypt and Cleopatra, but not against his fellow Roman Antony. See, he was smart. He wasn't like, he wasn't declaring war on the other side of Rome, essentially, um, against his person he's supposed to be ruling Rome with, you see. He's just going to declare war on Egypt. And, oh, <laughs> Antony happens to be hooked up with that woman. Um, so Octavian promoted himself as saving Italy from foreign control, not turning on his fellow Roman co-ruler and trying to take over Italy and the Roman Empire for himself. So this is a smart political move. Risky, but smart. The final showdown between Antony and Octavian was about to begin. And one thing about Octavian, not only was he very, very smart, and as I said before, great chess player, <laughs> um, he 
was willing to take risks when he thought that risk could win what he wanted to win. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say there were calculated risks, but they were still risks. And sometimes if you want to be the last man standing, you got to do something that wipes everybody out and you have to take risks. And again, Octavian was kind of a weakling looking fellow and it, he didn't seem like the type that would do those kind of things. And Anthony was more of this burly military man. And yet Octavian actually took more risks than, uh, than uh, Anthony. So now, now they're going to have to fight. All right. And I want to read you the basic concept. I, I got this for, this is just on, um, this is just a little thing on the internet about the battle of Actium. I want to read this to you because uh, it'll give you an, an idea of the basics that everybody says, and you'll see how they think about Cleopatra and Anthony. Okay. In the early spring of 31 BC. Oh, they, so let, by the way, hold on a second here. I, I, I forgot to set this up here. Let's let's get that here. Battle of Actium. <laughs> I meant to put that on the screen. All right. So the Battle of Actium is about to begin. And I'll, just to point out this as well, we have Cleopatra here. And these are the two men that her life is going to depend on. Okay. And she's going to want her man to win. She's going to want Antony to come out. Because if Octavian comes out the winner, she's in big trouble. So... Their two men are breaking up. <laughs> they're, they're, they're no longer pals, shall we say. They're breaking up, and she just hopes that the one that she's with is going to be the one that takes out the other. So, all right. So, the Battle of Actium. In the early spring of 31 BC, Marcus Agrippa, Octavian's boyhood friend and brilliant rural military commander. All right. So, by the way, Agrippa, he just was a great great commander. And so one thing um, was fortunate for Octavian is he had good people working for him. And Agrippa was one of the best. Um, he sailed his fleet southeast from the port of Brundisium, Italy, to the port of Methone on the southwest coast of Greece. Okay. Um, let me just throw up behind me just a, just a basic picture. We have Italy here. We have Greece over... So got out of the way. Greece over here. This is not an accurate picture, but basically they're saying that he 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 sailed from here over to here. Okay, Actium is here, so he sailed from this spot over to here. All right. Now, um, not long after he departed and the seas were calm, Octavian sailed his fleet to the west coast of Greece and. This is kind of a crappy picture of that. It, it, it was. He, he didn't really sail along the coast. He went over to, to the coast, the coast, and then he got his army to come, come down to Actium. All right. So now he's got his, his forces, the, the fleet coming in this way, and he's coming down with the army this way. And Actium's in the middle. All right. So... Meanwhile, Agrippa defeated Antony's small fleet at Methone and took control of the port. Then he sailed north along the west coast of Greece, defeating Antony's naval forces one port at a time and taking control of each city along the way. When Octavian and Agrippa met up at Actium, they put Antony and Cleopatra under siege. Octavian blocked the food supplies coming from the north and Agrippa blocked the grain supply coming from this is from Egypt, the grain supply becoming here. He blocked it here. So we have a we have a block up here. Well, maybe I can do it this way. Block up here and a block here. So they were stuck. Uh, Anthony and Cleopatra were stuck in the middle and couldn't get supplies in from either side. Not a good thing. They were trapped, and that's where the siege began. All right. Um, Anthony's best strategy would have been to retreat by land to the east with his army and survive to fight another day. So they're saying that he's got his fleet here. Because Patrick and Anthony have got their fleet and the army here. And, and Anthony, they say, should just take it off with his army and said, see you, Cleopatra. But Cleopatra argued against it. She had all her personal treasure, that's the Legui treasury, uh, and a large amount, well, a large amount of Egypt's treasure loaded onto her ships. So she had her ships with the treasury. 
if it were not a sea, for uh, if it were not a sea battle, she would have to abandon her ships and send her treasure to the bottom of the sea so Octavian wouldn't get it. So she'd lose her ships, the treasure, and then she'd have to sneak, I guess, slither off with Anthony back to Egypt and have nothing. <laughs> All right, not not a great option there. Um, against the advice of his generals, because now you see the generals don't like Cleopatra. This is what the story goes. And this is coming from Plutarch, our little favorite guy there who doesn't like either one of them. Anthony decided in her favor to fight a sea battle. So in other words, they're saying that Anthony had this ch chance to escape, but he listened to his wife and she made him fight the battle for her. And, you know, the heck with his men and everything else. Heck with Rome, you're going to fight for me. Um, his men were ravaged with illness and weak from a lack of food because of the siege. Once the battle was joined, it didn't take long for Cleopatra to see that Antony was going to lose. So what they're saying here is that Cleopatra made Antony go out to sea and fight, thinking he would win. But then she realized he's not going to win. Darn it all. So... So when she realized he was going to lose, then she decided as soon as there was an opening in the middle of the fight, she would she sailed right through it and headed south for Egypt. And she said, see ya. When Antony saw her sail away, he turned his ship south, deserting his army and sailed after. This is the lovesick puppy thing. So, so, Cleop so it's all Cleopatra's fault. She made... When they got trapped at, at Actium, um, she made Anthony fight at, the, at sea so she could escape, or she was hoping he would win, but when it didn't work, she just left him. She escaped, and he went after her, and all his men just died at sea, and that was just too darn bad. All right. And then Octavian set up a negotiation with the remainder of Antony's men and merged them into his army. Agrippa, Agrippa sailed back to Rome with a large part of the army while Octavian began marching his large army around the eastern end of the Mediterranean, heading to Egypt in pursuit of Antony and Cleopatra. So eventually he was going to come and get them. So that's the basic story that you will always hear. So it makes Antony and Cleopatra seem like idiots uh, and, and foolish and making terrible choices and like they did everything wrong, but you see, that's because they're they weren't they they're selfish or not bright or love sick or whatever they were. That's not how it went down. All right, so let me explain things a little bit more clearly of how it actually worked. All right, so here we are. All right, now what really happened? Okay, let me, let me get some pictures ready for this part of it, so it's not too confusing. Um, let me let me just check this one out here. Okay, um, what I wanted to show you here is that down at the bottom you'll see Alexandria, and you'll see that's Antony's fleet going up there to Actium. You will see Octavian's army going straight over, straight over to Greece, not sailing in the water, went down toward Actium at all but straight over to Greece and then the army coming down. Now, the reason I point this out is this map so stupidly, they show some, this thing going like this and that's not what's happening. He, uh, Octavian went straight over and then brought the army down. Look, look at the picture again. Straight over to Greece and then down with the army. All right, now you don't see Agrippa in the picture at all there, Agrippa's fleet. And there's a reason for this and I'm gonna show you what went wrong. All right. It was the winter of 33, 32 BC that Cleopatra and Anthony made their preparations for battle by assembling their fleet and forces in Ephesus. And that's Ephesus right there. That's where they got, they started out and then they went over to Actium. Their fleet was very impressive, huge in fact. And Antony may well have felt the spirit of Alexander the Great with him. Now, since he controlled the entire sea, uh, the entire sea power to the east. So he was like, he had all of this under control. 300 transport ships were at Antony's disposal, ships that were to bring food from Egypt 
and also carry the troops from Ephesus over to Actium across the Aegean Sea. And you can see right here, that's the Aegean Sea. So he had all these ships with food and all the supplies that were needed. <laughs> 300 transport ships. Now, uh, and they would also bring troops from Ephesus to Actium across the across the sea. So the, just more troops could come in here, more food could come in, all that. Now, they, Cleopatra and Anthony did not decide to invade Italy. There's a reason for that. And that's the reason they're sitting over here in Actium. They're going to have this confrontation at Actium in Greece rather than at home in Rome. Um, they did this because they knew it would be a number of assaults. They'd have to do a number of assaults to win. And they, they, first of all, they don't want to piss off the people by attacking it at the home, right? So they didn't want to do that. They wanted the citizenry not to be pissed off at them. Uh, so they kept it away from the citizens, essentially. But also, there's a lot of weather issues here. And this is something that a lot of the historians seem to completely ignore the issue about weather. You know, when you're controlling an entire fleet on water, the changes of weather make a huge difference on how successful you are. Also on land, there can be many, many problems on land as well. And you're gonna see both of these played into why Cleopatra and Antony basically ended up in the horrible situation that they ended up in. So, yeah, and when you have convoys coming through and all that, um, they can be attacked. So yeah, it, it's a lot of work, all right? so. The decision was made to have the showdown in Greece. In May of 32, Cleopatra and Anthony were stationed in Athens with their troops. It, by September, they had moved the base of operations to Pat Patras, and their, fl their fleet was moored in more than a dozen locations uh, along the western Grecian coast, from Actium in the north to Methone in the south. So we, they, had their, they had their fleet all the way down from Actium down to Methone. So there was a whole string of them. All right. And um, the plan was to force the encounter at Actium. And at Actium, Anthony and Cleopatra built two towers with artillery covering the mouth that connected the Ionian Sea and the Gulf of Ambracia, where Antony had ships waiting in the protected waters. And they waited there through the winter until Octavian made his move. So winter wasn't a good time to do much. So they were comfortable sitting there. Let me just kind of show you... Uh, I just want to show you them this. This well, that's not really a good picture. There, let me see if I can find a better picture. Okay, um, you see that Gulf of Ambracia, and then you see outside. Okay, so that's the sea. So you, there, that Anthony and Cleopatra's camp was there. You can see it right there, um, and uh, and then above you see an advanced camp. Eventually, up, up higher you'll see Octavian's camp. That's where he eventually came, and that turned out to be really lucky for him. And inside the red part right there, is, uh, the, the, there are ships stationed there. Now, this, this, I'll come back to this um, picture because the blue part represents uh, Octavian and Agrippa's uh, fleet, but we're not there yet. I'm just pointing out the, the little area that they were sta sitting around in during the winter, okay, waiting for, for, for uh, Octavian to get there. Now, this is where it all went wrong. <laughs> When Octavian did make his move, just as winter ended in 31 BC, it was not at all what Antony had expected, all right? He had thought quite reasonably that Octavian would push off of Italy, all right? So he thought, see what, see where that, do you see, see this, this area here, this, this, this line here, which is not the way Octavian went, but would be closer to what Anthony thought he would do that he would push off and he would come down the coast to Actium. And that seems reasonable because that's, it's not a, it's not that as big a way to go. Right. As if you went further South and came like this. So, and you get the, it's protected. This is what people don't understand. The reason he thought he was going to go down the coast, come and really just come across and go down the coast and let his army come down too. But he thought that, the, the, the fleet would come down the coast. Why? Because they were relatively protected coastal waters. And if you want to keep your ships, ships safe, 
you don't want to sail out into the sea here where weather can destroy your fleet. So this is but this is exactly what they did. Um, but Octavian, with his brilliant general Agrippa, made a very daring move. Agrippa took his fleet straight across open water, away from the coast and the prying eyes of enemy messengers who would have carried word of their progress down the coast. So when, when, when um, Antony is here with Cleopatra and they got all their, they got more ships going down here, they could hear from all their messengers how close they were coming down the coast so they could be prepared for everything. But that's not what they did. <laughs> Instead, Agrippa went right across the open sea. Okay. And let me show you actually the path he took. Um, the, what, 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 uh, this is actually in Russian. <laughs> it's the best I could find. Um, if you look up where it's, well, it's hard to see. Uh, the, the, the top arrow is what um, is what Antony expected. He expected the ships to come over to the coast, but then come down the coast to where it says where the huh, where that little um uh, uh it says am ampacnacum or something like that. I can't even I can't even say what it is. Where all the arrows point. That's Actium. So he expected him to come down the coast and slither through that little channel down there and he would be ready for him. But if you look, that's that what what uh, what Octavian did was he did go over to where that dot is. He came over from Italy to Greece, but then he just sent his armies down. He didn't come down with a fleet that way. The bottom blue line that goes all the way down and goes over to Meth. Uh, I forgot to pronounce that, Methune. Um, he actually came in below Actium, way below Actium. And then he moved his for, his his ships up and he attacked all the different, all the different um, outposts he had all the way up to Actium. And that's how, that's how Agrippa cut off his supply line because now none of his ships could get in from the south. But he never expected, he never expected Octavian and Agrippa to even go down there to the south. He thought they were only coming in from the north because going across that open water like that was considered so high risk you would never do it. Except they did it. <laughs> they risked dangerous storms at sea, took the long route down the Ita Italian peninsula and over to the southernmost outpost of Anthony's land force at Methone. Surprising their adversaries, they overran the isolated garrison, burned all the ships stationed there, established Octavian's forces in Greece, and cut off Antony's supply route to Egypt all in one fell swoop. That's what did them in. And yeah, crazy, brilliant and risky. Octavian's move paid off again. Had the weather not cooperated, the maneuver might have spelled the end of Octavian's campaign. In other words, he would have lost, could have lost his whole fleet, and he would just have been doomed. That's why Anthony and Cleopatra never thought they would take that risky a move. So they thought they were going to have their supplies. You know, they, they, you know, from from over here, down here, all their supplies could come in. From over here, all their supplies could come in. They thought they had that perfect until <laughs> Octavian had his people roll in this way and block everything right here and then go then go up, send up the fleet to just crush everything on the way. So now he was truly trapped at Actium with no way to get any of his supplies in here. Meanwhile, Octavian was coming down with the army this way, so he also couldn't get supplies coming down on land. So they had nothing coming in from either direction. And that was the bold move that Octavia made that people don't talk about how that was an incredible move, but very risky. And if you rolled the dice, I don't know whether it was 50-50 on that. You know what I mean? Um, and if, if he had failed taking that crazy across the water route um, out in the open and hit storms and everything else, <laughs> He would have been, that would have been it. Then, then Anthony and Cleopatra would have rolled on into Rome up here and taken over. And that would have been, they would now have the Roman Egyptian empire. That would have been it. But Octavian got 
super lucky. And Anthony and Cleopatra got nailed with that. And it was just extremely unfortunate for them. All right. Now, what do they do? So everything's not lost yet. Even though Octavian and Agrippa were inflicting quite a good bit of damage, Antony and Cleopatra could still continue to fight on sea and on land. And there was still a plausible chance of victory. Still a chance. In truth, they had a larger number of men, and so they may have felt that they still could win the battle. All right? But then more things went wrong. <laughs> Octavian perched his camp on a very defensible hill overlooking the bay. This is this picture here. Um, okay, Octavian's camp up there in the right-hand corner. He is high on a hill. And this keep this in mind. This is really important. He's up on a hill looking down on the bay. He's also looking down at all the ships and he's looking down at Antony and Cleopatra's camp. He knows what's going on down there. And this will play a very important part in the next bit. All right. So he's up there on this hill and Antony's camp there in a low lying area. They weren't planning to be stuck there. And they were, it was mosquito infested, sandy bit of land. Great for a few days, but not to where you get stuck in for a long time for a protracted period of time. As Antony waited for Octavian to make his move, and, uh, and Octavian's up on the hill going, <laughs> you trapped. <laughs> We're just going to sit up here. You can't get your supplies in. We're just going to sit up here. <laughs> so his men became sick from malaria and dysentery and mental fatigue. And since so many of them were mercenaries and not all so dedicated to the mission, desert desertions dramatically increased. So now he was losing his men. There, Anthony's troops remained trapped into the summer. This is a long time from spring to summer. He tried to block the water supply to Octavian's camp, but he failed. Desertions continued along with the deaths in his own camp. And then Agrippa captured the island of Lucas to the south, south of Actium, which is where Egyptian ships had been bringing in supplies and reinforcements. So there still was a little bit coming in, but then he blocked that. Then he went on to capture Pat Patras and Corinth, wiping out more supply routes in addition to barricading the harbor. Antony and Cleopatra found themselves in a pretty dire situation. By August, I believe Antony and Cleopatra knew that they were, to put it bluntly, in a hopeless situation. Now, Antony didn't have enough warriors to man the ships, to row or to fight on land and at sea effectively. One possibility was to simply abandon the fleet, take all the men, still a large force, and fight on land or retreat and come back to fight another day. That was one of his options. Now, the negative viewpoint on this, and this is what comes from the historians, is that Cleopatra wouldn't let him do that. And he had to give into her wishes. So while he had this chance to fight and get away, oh no, wifey, <laughs> put a stop to that. But there's a less jaded view that Antony recognized if he abandoned the fleet and Cleopatra, he would lose her support and the treasure, and he would have to take a disgruntled bunch of men off through a difficult terrain through high mountain passes with dwindling supplies and morale and survive through the coming winter. This was not a very attractive prospect. In my opinion, Anthony had to choose uh, the lesser of the two evils. If he escaped with the army, he might just as well sign his own death warrant, or at least accept that his military and political career was over. He would spend the rest, remaining years of, of his life in some backwater hiding from, um, from Octavia. All right, so so it was a pretty crappy choice, you know. It's like, and everybody goes, "Oh, he should have done that," you know, and then he'd be fine. No, he wouldn't be fine. <laughs> it was it was all over for him if he did that. But if he left with Cleopatra, he would still have a fleet and a lot of money, <laughs> and he could rejoin the rest of the dozens of legions that had remained behind in Egypt. As I have often said, if he and Cleopatra escaped. Anything could happen over the course of the next year uh, that could hold out hope of, one, putting them back in contention to take over the empire, especially if Octavian died or somebody killed him. Remember, again, Octavian was always sickly. So they, there was always the thought that he's just going to get some disease and die. Uh, it turned out to live a really, really, I, mean, I think he, I can't remember, I think he lived to like his 80s or something. He turned out to out outlast everybody. But he always appear like he could die the next week. You could hope he dies and then 
you you would get rid of them, right? Um, and that would to allow them to hold on to uh, Egypt. Now, if, if Octavian's power dwindled, they could at least keep Egypt, even if they lost Rome. Um, or three, giving them the opportunity to reestablish themselves elsewhere if they needed to flee. So if, if Cleopatra and Anthony could at least get away with the flute, uh, the flute, the fleet and the treasure, um, and get back to Egypt. And maybe they'd have to flee when, because the Romans were going to get there with Octavian, but maybe they could, and they did try this, by the way, go someplace else, like to India with all the money and the fleet and men reestablish themselves someplace else. And maybe in the future, if something happened to Octavian, they could come back. That, that was done over and over with the Ptolemies they often left and reappeared and then left and reappeared. So they could do that again. All right. So. I think a number of historians, ancient and modern, have been overly harsh with respect to Cleopatra and Anthony's decision to bolt from Actium with whatever they could take with them. And this is clearly the plan of action they decided to take and successfully enacted. So they did not fail in that, after they made that choice, they didn't fail. Now, the other thing that's amusing about this is uh, <laughs> that Plutarch and all the peoples after always seemed to say that when they left Actium, that Anthony was oblivious to Cleopatra's plan to leave. Uh, he was just back there. He saw her leave. And then he went, oh, my gosh, how did that happen? <laughs> he had no idea. This is nonsense. Um, actually, Octavian knew they were going to flee. And why would that be? <laughs> He's up. Well, let me put, go back to this map. Look at Octavian's camp. He's up looking down at the harbor. Now, what happens is, um, I'll set this aside for a minute. Um, there's two ways. The, the, the ships basically have two things going for them. The ship, when you're fighting, does not have sails on it. It slows the ship down and it's heavy. It's a, it, you do not put sails on a fighting ship. You put sails on a ship when you want to sail. OK, from up on, on the up, let me go back to this picture from up there in Octavian's camp. He's looking down going, oh, I see they're putting sails on a whole number of their ships. He knew what they were going to do. He knew they had to try to escape. Um, and so it's not a big surprise. And since since they were putting sails on the ship, do you think? Anthony had no idea when he saw all the sails going on the ships that he didn't know why. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he and Cleopatra said, how many ships should we do this? How many ships should we put the sails on? I'm sure they discussed an entire plan. He wasn't sitting back there and she's like, take a nap. <laughs> put the sails on. <laughs> this is ridiculous. She didn't sneak the sails on. They knew the sails were going on the ships. Everybody did, including Octavian. So everyone knew what the plan was. So, so Octavian knew, and he had two choices. Um, he One was to simply allow them to go through his blockade and then pick off as many ships from the fleet as he could, but uh, the, that, the, that looked kind of wimpy, so he wasn't going to do that. Uh, the, uh, the more ships, um, and he didn't, want, he didn't want to get away with that many ships and men because that meant they were still around for future battle, right? So what he could do was reduce their numbers as much as possible by forcing them to fight, but make sure the Legate treasury didn't sink. So he wasn't he's going to make sure Cleopatra's ship didn't go down because all the money was on there and he needed that money because <laughs> when he got to, when he gets to Egypt and Congress and he wants the treasure it's super important because he needs the money to pay off all the, the people back in um, Rome, all the soldiers and everybody he was, didn't ha quite have the funding for. So, I think the battle actually went as planned on both sides. Cleopatra loaded sails onto her ships and her fleet stayed safely behind the battle lines. Okay, so just like I take a pic quick pic look at this. Um, yeah, okay, so we have out there the black lines, that's, that's, that's uh, Octavian and, and, and uh, Agrippa and Cleopatra is behind the lines with their ships. Okay. The little red lines of their ships. So they're behind, they're ready to go. And essentially, let's see if this is bigger, essentially at a certain point, Cleopatra is going to go through the lines. Okay. Now to do that, how is this done? All right. 
So Cleopatra loaded sails onto her ships and her fleet stayed safely behind the battle lines. Antony loaded sails onto some of his ships as well. Octavian knew that they had done this and that the sails meant a plan to hurry off, not to stay and fight, since added sails reduced the maneuverability of the ships. Okay, Octavian moved his ships out into the harbor so that Antony would be forced into the open with his warships. Then the battle would begin, but this time with Octavian in possession of far more ships than Antony. All right, and that's because he didn't have enough men to, because uh, uh, he lost a lot of men, so they couldn't. He didn't have enough oarsmen. Uh, and he's also got the ones he put the sails on, so he's got a limited amount of ships to fight. Octavian could easily force Antony's ships to spread out in a line and then have his own ships surround each one of Antony's and take them down. And that's exactly what happened on the morning of September 2nd, 31 BCE. The Battle of Acting began. Octavian and his generals waited with his fleet at a distance from the shore while Antony went out to engage him and the fighting began. Then the day wore on and the lines naturally thinned. Cleopatra waited for the afternoon wind to shift so she could put up her sails and speed southward. A change of wind which she expected. It was not a stroke of luck, as Plutarch would have us believe. Oh, look, I suddenly have wind. Oh, I can leave. No, <laughs> she knew how things worked. She was ready for that moment. When the time was right, her fleet of 60 ships sailed quickly through the center of the lines. And when Anthony saw her make her break, he transferred from an, the unwieldy ship he was on to a smaller, faster galley with sails, which he had conveniently waiting by. And he set after Cleopatra with about 20 of his own ships. At least this is the number Plutarch gives us, okay? Um, Plutarch claims that two-thirds of the fleet were left behind to fight on and would eventually surrender. Okay. Uh, but Cleopatra, Antony, and the Legide treasury and a sizable portion of their combined fleet were safely on their way back to, where, can't do this, <laughs> right there, <laughs> Alexandria. Okay, so they're up, they're up here, I'm sorry, and now they're just flaunt, getting back here to Alexandria. So Octavian was clearly the victor at the Battle of Actium. That did not mean that Anthony and Cleopatra were completely destroyed. Anthony was still in charge of half of the Roman Empire, and Cleopatra was still in charge of Egypt. Now, biggest problem was that uh, some of the client kingdoms were getting word that Octavian had won and they were getting a bad attitude toward Antony. Um, so they didn't, the, the client kingdoms might give more men and, um, and materials to Octavian and not to Ant Antony. So there was knowledge at that point, Cleopatra and Antony knew that eventually, uh, Octavian was going to come around here. He was, he was, he was going to come around here to Egypt and he was going to attack them. And he was going to hopefully for, that's what Octavian wanted to take, finally win, take down Anthony, take down Cleopatra and take over Egypt. Um, it's like a domino effect. And that's, that's what the last year was like. Um, now, understand this. Although Cleopatra and Anthony realized that they were in trouble and their power was going to erode, as his army advanced, it didn't mean it was all over. So again, there's possibilities after Actium happened, there's other possibilities that could save their butts. <laughs> um, now, and they could switch to plan B. Okay. And they did. And I'm, I'm going to explain what plan B was actually is a plan B and maybe a plan C. Yeah. Well, there's plan B and plan C. Okay. And I'm going to, those are going to be in the future shows. Um, although there were rumors that there were rumors from Rome that at least there was at least one plan to assassinate Octavian, that could be in that. And then Octavian would never get to Egypt. They would be okay, and they wouldn't need Plan B or Plan C. Um, his health again; if he just died. They wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, it's also the Roman soldiers who served Octavian wanted their pay, could take matters into their own hands and depose their leader because they're fed up not getting paid. Maybe that could happen. Um, Cleopatra and Anthony knew they had to find a way to escape the coming wrath of Octavian, assuming bad luck never fell on him uh, before he arrived to finish him off. So um, so for act, the whole thing, Actium, it could have gone either way. 
And unfortunately for uh, Anthony and Cleopatra, it went Octavian's way. When Agrippa went across that ocean, that sea, sorry, not the ocean, when he went across the open sea and it hit them from below, it was a brilliant move and very, very fortunate for Octavian that it didn't fail. And that's why Cleopatra and Anthony lost at Actium. Um, they didn't have a bad plan. It just didn't go their way. And um, so now they've they escaped down to Egypt the best way they could possibly do it. They had to get as many ships out, the Legate treasury, and at least get back to Egypt where they have a chance. So if anything happens to Octavian or his power, they may never have to confront him or deal with him or you know, arriving in Egypt. Unfortunately for them, again, Octavian had great luck. Nobody killed him. He didn't die. And he did come to Egypt. It did take him one year to get there. So a lot of people think that, you know, they fled to Egypt and, and Octavian was there next week. <laughs> you know, this is not the modern world. Things didn't happen that quickly. So they had an entire year to try to figure out a plan B or a plan C to save themselves in case he showed up. And so, uh, so next time uh, in part five, I'm going to talk to you about plan B, how they try to essentially escape Egypt and establish themselves elsewhere and then be ready to do that if they saw that he was going to arrive. And so, I'll talk about plan B in part five, and I hope you will join me for that. Um, uh, and if you're new to this channel, please do like and subscribe. Check my playlist. And if you haven't seen all the Cleopatra ones, go to the playlist, which is The Murder of Cleopatra. And the book is much more details in the book. The, the link below for my book is down there. And um, this will also give you all the, the, all the footnotes and bibliography will show you where I got all this information from to come to these conclusions. I didn't just make them up completely out of my head. They had to be evidence to base my um, determinations on. And say in this, it always amazes me how the whole Actium story is so insulting to Cleopatra and Anthony when they actually did a pretty fantastic job. They just got, you know, they just got beaten. That's all there is to it. And any, any small thing could have changed that. Uh, so I think Plutarch, you know, made them look terrible. And for some reason, historians haven't uh, resurrected their, uh, their, <laughs> They're, they're um, the whole story. They just haven't haven't fixed it. And so that's one of the reasons I wanted to write the whole book, The Murder of Cleopatra, not just about her death, but about her life and all the different events, because I still think she's a very brilliant queen and not enough credit is given to her. So anyway, thank you for being here and I'll be back with uh, part five. See you then. <music>